Welcome, my name is Ryan, and this is my wife, Abby. We think you picked a great day to join us here at Salem Community Church's online campus. We have a wonderful message for you today, so let's jump right on in. What we're looking at is, is people that, uh, it's a deep dive, really, into Hebrews 11. It's a, it's a deep dive into the people that we would call these heroes of faith. But if we really want to get down to it, I don't, it, it doesn't, hearing about Abraham's faith, how he's the father of many nations, hearing about Moses and leading a, a million plus, two million plus people through the Red, I mean, first of all, the 10 plagues, and then through uh, in the wilderness, through the Red Sea, uh, thinking about like David versus Goliath, those like highlight real moments really don't resonate with me if I'm just being transparent. They don't resonate with me. What resonates with me is people like Gideon who battled insecurity and low self-esteem. Who, who like, who really, the people that resonate with me is like, uh, let, me, let me see, uh, um, uh, 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 Samson, who had really cool moments, like yes, highlight reels, but internally struggled to overcome his own flesh. It, it sounds weird if you, you heard me say it last week. If you didn't, it might be like, oh, that's a little bit awkward. Like, who resonates with me out of this entire list of people is Rahab, who was a prostitute, just making terrible life decisions. I resonate with them. Now, they're still listed in the Hebrews 11 heroes of faith, but I resonate, I resonate with the folks who, ha like, show their flaws, I resonate with the misfits and failures of Hebrews 11, not, the, not the, the, the folks that have it all together and just seem to have their life neatly packaged and everything's cozy and everything's good to go. And like, I resonate with the flaws of those guys. I, I, the, here, here's, a, here's, here's what I want to I, I look at. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, through this translation, it says, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us, the misfits, uses us, the failures, uses us, the flawed and the broken, to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere we go. That's, think about this, he uses he, 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 he captivates us. He overtakes us. He overwhelms us with his grace, his mercy, and love, which are new every morning. And we are a part of his triumphal procession. And he uses all the broken pieces of our life to do something incredible through. It's a, he has taken captive, here, let me just read it to you. He has taken captive our brokenness and our waywardness. We misfits and failures and create something beautiful from it all. We think we have to be perfect. We think we have to hide our issues. We think uh, that our flaws disqualify us, that our weaknesses discount us, uh, uh, but that we, but if people really knew the real us, that, that we would be cast aside, but, but he causes our misfitness, he causes our mishaps, our mistakes, and our malevolence uh, to become moments of ministry and masterpieces of his grace. This is, this is what he does. Uh, our manipulations, our malice, he conquers them. Our waywardness and rebellion, he overtakes them. He doesn't cause our failures. He doesn't cause our faults and our fiascos, our catastrophes. He overcomes them each and every time. He, what used to smell of wretchedness, he has made righteousness. Uh, what used to smell of garbage, he has made grace. What used to smell of drama, he has made mercy. What used to smell of litter, he has made love. That's the Jesus we serve and salute as king. He's the God of the misfit, and he is the God of the failure. And if you're looking for a perfect church with a perfect pastor, you are in the wrong one. I'm just letting you know, you picked the wrong place to be this morning. But if you carry brokenness on the inside of you and you're navigating your life trying to figure out, God, can you use 
this mess that I am. Man, you're in the right place this morning. Because I believe God wants to speak to you. Uh, I want to, we have entire stores and, and websites. Uh, we visit them on Madison Street uh, that, that take what other people discard. Sorry, Mike. Turn the dirt off. Old barn wood. That others would say, I mean, it's full of nails, full of holes, it's rotten, it's pretty rough on some end. You, you probably should have a tetanus shot if you're going to grab it, right? What others would discard in the right hands, huh, what others would call refuse, others can reclaim and rehab it, re-inhabit and re-remake and rework so it has value and so that it has purpose. And you, it may not be its intended purpose from the onset, but its brokenness recreated can make something beautiful. I'm so glad that we serve a Jesus who was a master carpenter and could take broken things and reclaimed things and, and rework them for his purpose. And rework them for his glory. Amen, church? Amen. Come on, amen? The, the character I want to look at. Oh. I got to think about touching things. It's, it's just me. It's, it's weird. I'm weird. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> Here's the, the character I want to look at this morning. He's listed in the Hebrews 11. His name is Jacob. It's a really, really cool story. You find his story in Genesis, I think it's 25 through about 50. Uh, we're going to land in, 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 in one of the chapters in chapter 32. I don't want to go there just now. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little back, a back story. Uh, born around 1836 B.C., so 1,800 years before Christ, he's the, the, uh, the second of, his twin, of the twins, e Jacob and Esau, born to Isaac and Rebekah. His name, it really has two names. One means heel grabber because there's a, a whole story about it uh, uh, when he was being born. Uh, but there's a, a second portion of his name that actually means deceiver. Names meant, names were a big deal back then. We don't, we look for cool names. We look for unique names. Like that's, that's 2022 that, that we don't really put as much often. Some people, I don't know, maybe you're different. Who knows, right? But, uh, but we, we, at this point, there was a meaning behind the name. We didn't just Rolodex on the great Google in the sky and pick one, like, you know, top 10 names for 2022, right? Right? So his name means deceiver. Uh, he was known for being shrewd and manipulative with his brother Esau when Esau is at a point that he is so hungry that he sells his own birthright for a bowl of Campbell's chicken noodle soup. It was like, okay, maybe it was like, you know, homemade chicken noodle. I don't know. But it, like I'm, his birthright, the fact that he was going to be the head of the entire family, he would get a double portion of all of the family inheritance that he would lead. And he, after his father died, he would be the figurehead. He sold it for a bowl of frosted flakes. That's basically what he did. I'm hungry. I'm not going to value this, so yeah, whatever you can bring my way. If it's Frosted Flakes, if it's porridge, if it's Campbell's soup, who knows? It, it just saw, he, he sold it for a bowl of food, right? Now, we can, we can tout his issues all you want, but the fact is that Jacob is the one that manipulated the situation, this deceiver. He then, right, if that wasn't enough, he conspires with his mom to, to deceive his dad into giving the blessing of the firstborn onto him instead of Esau. Like this is, he, like just drama is just following this guy. It's not like, oh, that's the wrong place at the wrong time. No, you're full of drama. You're full of problems. Right? He fears because now these two situations, he fears his brother Esau and leaves for, for Haran, which where his family had originally come from, 
And he goes and he finds a, 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 a family and a wife, but even then the drama follows him and there's drama between he and his father-in-law constantly over the course of like 20 some years. It's just nonstop, every time. So he's leaving. Finally, he's going to go back to his father's household, but he, he hears there, there's a band of people coming his way. And he hears and finds out that it's led by his brother Esau. And this is where we're going to pick up in Misfits and Failures today in Genesis 32. It's a, uh, Genesis 32, it's just a couple of verses of scripture. I'll read it for you. If you have your Bible, you should turn to it. If you don't, you should write this down so you can go read it when you get home tonight. Genesis 32, we're going to start with cha uh, chapter 32, verse 22. If you have a pen, you can write it on your neighbor's arm. It'll help you and them both remember. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After, verse 23 says, after he sent them across the stream, he sent them over with all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that the hip was wrenched and out of socket as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said to him, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Verse 27 says, the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. I want to I want to point out two things as kind of introductory before we get into this 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 story is that we are all wrestling with something. We're all wrestling with something like wrestling with God. Do you hear me? God, do you care? Hey, kid. Let's just, let's not be fake because it's exhausting. We have people in the room and f folks worshiping with us right now online. God, are you real? Are you like, like, am I just going through the motions? Like, we have people in the room, people listening right now that are struggling with submitting to God's plan. People that are wrestling with God, vying and fighting for control of our lives, control of our families, wrestling for control of our finances, wrestling for control of our futures, wrestling and fighting with God for his plans and even for our past. We have people in the room, we do it. We are, we are constantly wrestling for, for, for God, are you really going to show up? Are you really going to do what you said you're going to do? Are you really going to move like you said you're going to move? I'll go through the motions, but internally, I'm at a tug of war. There's this internal striving on the inside of people in the room, right? Don't look around. They might be sitting next to you, or it might just be you, and you're trying to put on a front. That we're fighting inside. We are at war with the notion and the understanding of, God, am I really going to let you have access to that area of my life? Am I going to give you, am I going to secede and give you control of all of my heart, of all of, God, I'm fighting because I want to be in control of my children and I don't know how to give you control of them my fam I mean, come on this is what we do we're at war internal we we are constantly wrestling but here's what I love God refused to overpower Jacob in this moment he would not overtake Jacob's own will he would not. We, we are free moral agents. We have the opportunity to choose. And God loved him enough to refuse to overpower Jacob's own will. It had to be Jacob's decision 
to submit. It had to be Jacob's decision to surrender. It had to be Jacob's decision to throw in the towel and to give up. That's love. That means we are not his toys and we are not his trinkets that he can play with and then potentially get bored with and push us off the side and go about his merry way. He really is a good, good father that genuinely loves us. That's the God that we serve. And now we get to the awkward moment of this entire story. It is just simultaneously interesting, but it's awkward. These two, Jacob and God, they are fighting one for another. God realizes that the sun is coming up. He says, I need you to let me go. I've been in a few fights in my life, okay? Not recently. I'm not like a brawler. I pretend to be, but I'm not. I used to hold my sister down, cross her arms over her chest, and I would spit Cheetos in her face. Because she was a bully to me until we got to high school and I finally outweighed her. I really didn't. I was still like 112 pounds soaking wet in high school. Uh, but just like, just a little guy, right? But, but I, I've been in a few altercations, not a lot. Now, I'm not saying like, I'm, you know, let's go like get brass knuckles and, you know, figure this out in the parking lot. But we can if you want. I'm just kidding. Am I? We don't know. I'm just kidding. I've never said in a fight, right? If you have, I've got to hear this story. But I've never said in a fight, you've got to let me go. And the person respond, I won't let you go unless you bless me. (laughs) This is the weirdest fight I've ever heard about in my life. And then... The response is not, what are you talking about? The response is, what is your name? So we're going from a fight to you got to let me go. I won't let you go unless you bless me, okay? This is the context of the fight, a blessing. The response doesn't make sense. What is your name? Jacob responds, He responds with more than his name. He responds with the sum total depiction of what everyone else has always called him. He gets gets in in the middle of the struggle. He's like, I, I really don't know who I am, so I will give you the answer of what they have always called me. I, I really don't have a firm understanding of my own identity, so I will, I will at least regurgitate and repeat to you what they have always called me. I, am, I, I, I'm, I will tell you that I'm rebellious, so they called me this. I'm drama-filled, so they called me this. I'm, I'm wayward, so they called me this. I, 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 I'm, I'm strong-willed, so they, they called me this. I really don't know who I am, so I'm just going to tell you what they've called me I am the deceiver my name is Jacob God comes along you're not going to be known by that anymore I'm going to call you something else but isn't isn't it interesting what Jacob responds with is everything that life had assigned to him Jacob's response to this, sorry, I knocked something over. Jacob's response to this moment was everything that everyone else had pinned on him. Jacob, he says, I really, I don't have a good understanding of who I am. I'm just going to tell you what they've affixed to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you uh, what, what they've called me. I'm going to tell you uh, uh, what they've labeled me. I, I'm going, I, I, don't, I don't have a strong understanding in and of my own. So, so, so I, what they've fastened to me, that will be my response of your, to the, the, the answer to your question. I, uh, what, what I, what I, I don't know really who I am. What I do know is I feel unloved, and that's what life 
has put on me. So that's my response. I really don't know who I am. I feel unloved, and, and that's, what, that's what life is. God, do you love me? Are you, are you sure you're, you're around me? I've, I've made some mistakes, so I actually feel ashamed. So I will give you the answer of who I am based on how I feel to the fact that shame is attached to me. If it really comes down to it, I'm going to tell you who I am. I, I, I'm insecure because of my shame, because the fact of the matter is I'm embarrassed by my past. I'm embarrassed by all my problems. So, so that, that's who I am. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you who I am. This, isn't this what life does to us? Life pins to us. Hey. You're unworthy. Life attaches to us that your past disqualifies you. Life tells you, right, right, that you're flawed. Life attaches to you that you're not good enough. Come on, what, what is life attached to you? What is, what is life? Get in there. But, is it, but isn't that what life does? It bluntly pummels you as it attempts to attach to you. It doesn't care how you feel. It doesn't care that you're being wounded in the moment. All because we don't really know who we are. That's what Jacob's response is. I'm going to tell you what everyone else has pinned to me. I'm going to tell you that's who I am. And I love that God comes along and says, you're not going to be known by that anymore. You're not going to be known because you have fear you're not going to be known because you have anger. You're not going to be known because you were divorced. You're not going to be known because you had an affair. You're not going to be known because you have perverse thoughts running through your mind. You're not going to be known because you struggled with addiction. You're not going to be known because you struggled with a bottle. You're not going to be known because you struggled with a substance. You're you're not going to be you're not going to be known as the gossip. You're not going to be known as the you're not going to be known as flawed and as a failure. You're not going to be known because you think you're I say you're strong. The problem is we still have things pinned to us. Nailed to us. So we walk around being embedded with everything that we think is our identity. That's not who God calls us. He sees something so much greater. He sees something so much more valuable. He sees something so much more purposeful. With Jesus, the tool that killed him, the cross, was the tool that actually freed him. He was the son of man. All God, son of God, son of man. Because man had to pay. What are you saying, Nathan? That the same tool that. Daniel Herndon was much better at this during St. Pelagian than I was. And being able to drive a nail with one hit. Here, here's, what, here's what happens when, when you're unloved. That's not how God sees you. When you're unloved, he, he sees Isaiah 49 that says, can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child that she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not, I feel unloved, but I have, but he says, I haven't forgotten you. I have written you on the palms of my hand. And what he does, the same tool that feels like it's killing us is now the tool that pulls out what would had us, what would keep us pinned down. 
Come on, another, another verse right there, uh, 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 Jeremiah 31. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, loving kindness, I have drawn you. You are not a bother to God. You are not a disappointment to God. He loves you with an everlasting love. I, you, you don't understand the love that he has for you because our love is conditional on what you do for me. Therefore, I will love you. But his love is agape. It is unconditional. There's nothing you could do that would make him love you less because he is love love there's nothing you could do that would make him love you more because you get all of him there is well you you feel you feel shame because of decisions because of what's happened to you you feel sh you're embarrassed to let people know uh, here uh, Romans 8 34 says who there is to condemn us uh, for G Christ Jesus, who died and more than that was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for us. What does that mean? He is talking nonstop to God about you. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Do you understand that when he died for you, he died knowing the 100% full totality of all the mess your life would ever encompass? He knows the junk you're going to do next week. He knows the depravity, the wretchedness, the grotesque, embarrassing moments that you want to hide and cover up. And he's begging you, please don't do that. Let me just pull shame off of you. Don't be known by your shame. Be known that I love you, that I don't condemn you, that I am for you and I am not against you. I'm not mad at you. I am mad about you and madly in love with you. Come on, that's who he is. Come on, hear me, hear me. Uh, uh, Romans 5, but God demonstrates this in his own love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He knew all about it and still said yes. Knew all about the, knew every single problem says I love you and I don't care I said I love you and I'm not worried about it uh, he, uh, your insecurities I'm not worried about them he wants to pull them off of you first Samuel we we look and say I'm not qualified I'm not good enough I don't have what it takes first Samuel says I, he doesn't look at the outside God looks at the inside he's not interested in how you stack up in front of the world around you he looks at you broken he looks at you flawed he looks at you full of fear and full of anxiety he looks at you with the testimony of your past knowing how busted that you are and says I can do something with this I can remake you he wants to pull that off he wants to pull off of you feeling flawed you feel like a failure he wants to pull that off uh, uh, you're flawed Psalms 139 for you form me in my inmost being you knit me together in my mother's womb I praise you for I am you're not flawed. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're, you're wired on purpose. For purpose. He didn't need another Nathan. He needed a you. He didn't, he didn't need another Danny. He needed a Richie. He didn't need another Daniel. He needed a Tyler. He didn't need another Gary, he needed a Mike. He didn't need another Matt, he needed a Steve. You, you, are, you are wired. Think about this, when he cre in creation, he created it all. And knowing the end from the beginning, knowing the end from the beginning, looked at all of creation. There's not one time he didn't look at creation 
and say, ah, not good enough. Every single time he looked at it, end from the beginning, he said, it is good. It's good. It's the way I need it. It's purposeful for what I want to do. He, he, like, look, we look, we look and we, we say that we're, we're unworthy. Right? He pulls that off. When he says, let us, in, in Hebrews, let us then walk with confidence. King James says, boldly before the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He pulls off of us uh, uh, that, that our, our past decisions, they disqualify us. And he says in Psalms 103, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases and redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, he removed our transgressions from us. But God, I've done thus and so. I don't know anything about that. I'm, I'm unaware of your disqualifications. I'm unaware of your discounted nature. I don't know anything about that because the work I did, it was a complete work. He pulls off of us everything that had us pinched, pinned, held down. Watch, and then he, he remakes us into something new. Out of this moment, a real encounter with God, hear me, after a real encounter with God, Jacob, now renamed, given a God identity, Israel, in this moment, walks away limping. Because anytime you have a real encounter with Jesus, you walk different afterwards. I'm not talking about a decision for Christ. I'm talking about you had an authentic encounter with him. You walk differently. He, he, just, he walked away with a limp. The rest of his life was a reminder he had an encounter with God and God touched him. He wants to do that for a lot of people in this room today. I genuinely believe that. Wow, what an incredible message. I'm so glad you joined us today. If you would like to worship with your giving and help us to spread the gospel, you can text the amount you would like to give to 84321 or you can give safely and securely at salemcommunity.church. At Salem Community Church, we are here to create community centered on Christ. We'll see you again next week.